Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you all for coming out on this Easter weekend, uh, this Passover weekend. For me, it's a weekend. Uh, but uh, it's great to have you all here, and I appreciate you making the effort. Um, more importantly, I'd like to introduce uh, Professor Laura Green, uh, one of the uh, giants in her field, and a, a, a pleasure to have uh, here speaking to us today. So uh, Laura is a uh, professor of physics uh, over in our, our sister department, and it's really kind of her to come over. This is our, our second uh, lecture in the series from one of our colleagues in physics. Uh, as you know, uh, Paul Quiat was here a few weeks ago and gave a really wonderful talk. Uh, I've seen Professor Green speak before, and it's uh, sure to be good. So, sorry, I don't mean to raise, raise the bar, make it hard. Uh, so, um, uh, Professor Green is, uh, as I mentioned, a professor over in the physics department. She is also a professor in the Center for Advanced Study here on campus, which is uh, really a fairly big deal. She's also the Swanland professor in physics. Uh, she uh, has her PhD from Cornell University, and uh, spent uh, nine years at Bell Labs then before coming here, right about the time I was finishing my undergrad and we were just discussing. You don't have to go into that. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> um, uh, Professor Green is also uh, the uh, vice president of the American Physical Society, which I believe has an orderly progression right up through president. Yes, and so we will uh, we will be referring to her as uh, a Potaps. president. They right. Potaps. Potaps. Oh yes, fantastic. So and I, I told him I, that I, if I was called Potaps, I'd do the job, and they said no problem. Um, it also means she's got an incredibly busy schedule, and so uh, I'd like to thank her for fitting us in and for showing up with these wonderful demos. Um, she is a member of the National Academy of Sciences, a uh, fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, American, Advancement, uh, American Association for the Advancement of Science, and the American Physical Society. As you know, she's won the Guggenheim Fellowship, uh, the E.O. Lawrence Award for Materials Research, the Maria Gopert Meyer Award, and the Belcour Award for, Award for Excellence. Uh, and without okay. further ado, <laughs> Professor Green. Okay, thank you very much. It was, it's a real pleasure to be here. So I'm hoping this will be a fun talk, and I would encourage interruptions and questions as I go along. So let's just start that way. And so. The, the title of my talk is High Temperature Superconductivity, Taming Serendipity. And the reason why I call it Taming Serendipity is because there's a lot of reasons, and I've got some cartoons here of reasons why we want new and better superconductors, but nobody has any idea how to design one. So part of my research is trying to design new superconductors, of which we are completely clueless. Um, so I work with, I'm the uh, Associate Director of the Center for Emergent Superconductivity, which is a DOE-funded Energy Frontier Research Center. And this is what we work on. Brookhaven is the lead institution, Argonne and University of Illinois. Um, superconductors would have, and I will show you, because the applications for superconductors are really fantastic, and there's real niches where they should be used, and we need the funding. So that's another argument, is that sustained funding for fundamental applied research. I will show you a big impact that superconductors can have on our power grid. These are turbines, and the big impact that superconductors can have on that, yes? Can we turn the overheads down just a little? Can we turn the overheads down just a little? He said yes. Okay, Ian, thank you. <laughs> so in the meantime, I'll just keep moving on here. And these are called superconducting magnetic energy storage SMEs. They're just simple toroids that hold a power, and I'll show you why those are important. I will also stress that the technology for all these superconducting applications has existed since the, since the 60s. The other thing that we do is go running around the periodic table to try to design new superconductors and try to understand what the mechanism is. Now, I won't have time to discuss the mechanism here, but one thing that I will mention is that these superconductors superconduct because the electrons are paired. And I'll mention that again later. I'm just putting out some words to get going. So what is a superconductor? That's what I'm going to start with. Um, why we need better superconductors, and what I mean by a better superconductor. It's not necessarily that it superconducts at a higher temperature. A little bit of the history of serendipitous discovery. I think we're going the wrong direction with the lights, but, <laughs> but that's, that's okay. I'll just keep talking. Uh, towards renewables and why superconductors would have a big impact on renewable energy, and then 
how can we design? I'm not going to spend much time on that, and I won't have any time to talk about my own research, but I'll just mention that I am doing research in this. This is, I'm going to show you several of these plots here. This is resistance versus temperature. And in a metal, you have a certain resistance. The electrons go through the metal, and as you lower the temperature, the resistance decreases. And I'll talk about that in the next slide. What's really happening is that if things are high temperature, like you're boiling water, things are bouncing around. And the lattice is bouncing around, and the electrons trying to carry the current will hit these bouncing around things. And as you lower the temperature, this bouncing around calms down a little bit, and the resistance decreases. And in a superconductor, it jumps to zero. This is a type 1 and a type 2 superconductor. It's more abrupt with the type 1. And this is something else I'm going to describe a little more. This is what we call the Meissner effect. If you put a superconductor in a magnetic field, the magnetic field is expelled. So these are the defining properties of a superconductor. Number one, conducting electricity with no loss of power, none. So if you have a light bulb here and a battery in Tallahassee, and they're connected by superconducting wires, no problem. There's no loss in the wire. So it's a, amazing that you do not lose power when you're conducting with superconducting wires. The next thing is perfect anti-magnetism. Diamagnetism means anti-magnetism. That's why things float. Um, and uh, what the other thing that we know when these are measured, this perfect diamagnetism indicates that you have long-range quantum mechanical order. I'm going to say this one more time, because I don't want to get a lot of stuff in mechanism. It's kind of ooey, ooey, fancy stuff. But electrons are something that we call a fermion. It has a little magnetic property, it's spin one half, that says that, OK, there were some statistics worked out by Mr. Fermi a long time ago that said that no two electrons or fermions can occupy the same quantum state at the same time. So they can't be in the same place at the same time. They're just not allowed. But if you're spin one, if you can combine these into a pair and make two halves equal to a one, that's called a boson. And they can do that. So if this is a superconductor above its superconducting transition temperature, and all superconductors need to be cooled to date, you have 10 to the 26 electrons in here, and each electron has a wave function associated with it. And you need 10 to the 26 wave function to describe what's going on here. What happens in a superconductor is the electrons pair up in a really clever way that was discovered down the street here, OK? In a really clever way, in this fancy schmancy kind of Cooper pairing. And because they're paired up and they act like bosons, they can fall into the same quantum state. So the bardeen cooper schrieffer BCS theory of superconductivity was that these paired up, and now, instead of needing 10 to the 26, you need one wave function. All the electrons fall into the same quantum state. So you know what an electron is going on here, what's going on here, something else is going on there, it's one state. And so the big question was, how do you have all the electrons go into one state? How can you repeal Coulomb's law? Well, they figured it out. It was amazing. But and this is to tell you what does zero electrical resistance mean. Because it's hard to understand this. Now we're past the winter here, but a few weeks ago we had our space heaters. And if we sent current through the wire into the space heater and everything was working correctly, the coils in the space heater, which are designed to have a high resistance, you know, these hard, rough, bouncy coils, it's hard for the electrons to get through. And just like when you rub your hands together, the electrons create a lot of resistance. The electrons create a lot of heat because of that high resistance. But if everything's working right, the cool copper, the w copper wire stays cool, even though it's the same current going through the copper wire and through the space heater. Why? Copper wire is designed to have a very low electrical resistance. So there's very little heat dissipation. The heater wire has a high electrical resistance, so there's a lot of heat dissipation. A superconductor, when you cool it down, Zero electrical resistance, perfect electrical conduction. And so it's hard to get your head wrapped around it, but you have to cool superconductors. So you cool superconductors with this stuff called liquid nitrogen now. OK, this is very fun stuff. And um, I will show you what the effect that liquid nitrogen can have. Looking at this picture here, this is to get the temperature scale. Boiling water in the Fahrenheit scale is about 212, and in the centigrade scale is 100 degrees centigrade. So most of you are a little bit familiar with the centigrade scale. 
What we use in physics is the Kelvin scale. We use the Kelvin scale because it's a thermodynamic scale. Zero temperature is zero. You cannot get colder. So if you go out into the middle of space, like way out there, you'll get down to three degrees. That's as cold as you can get because of the background radiation from the Big Bang. But in our laboratories, we can make colder and colder temperatures, and that's kind of a fun direction to study. And up until about 1986, 1987, all superconductors had to be cooled down to a really cold temperature. Let me give you an idea how cold this is. This is your general hot gas container, which is a balloon. Now, to get an idea how cold this stuff can be, even for the high temperature superconductors, so what we have here, the high temperature superconductors can go up to about 150 degrees, but that is still really cold. And what we have here is liquid air. Now, an advantage of the high temperature superconductors is that liquid air is very cheap. It's like 20 cents a liter. It's cheaper than beer. It's cheaper than milk, sorry, or whatever. And, uh, and, and if you're a physicist, it costs 20 cents a liter. If you go to a doctor to have a wart burned off, we charge them about 5 or $10 a liter, but what can you do? And so things, when you cool things down, they shrink. Whoops. <laughs> it's going slowly here. I'm going to have to put more nitrogen in here. And so you can put a balloon in here, and we, you can see how much it's shrinking. Why? Because you're cooling down the air inside of this balloon. And you can just cool way down, and it can disappear. And that big balloon is going to disappear within this. I won't do too many of those. Another way to tell how cold things are is I was going to get flowers, and I didn't, so I stole these out from out in front. Here's some nice, soft fern, OK? Nice and soft. And I'm going to, you guys come up here afterwards and play with it. If I stick this in liquid nitrogen, it's bubbling like this because the fern thinks it's so hot. And in fact, when you see this stuff going on the table, you can see this stuff running around here. I don't know if you can see that. But you can come up afterwards, and we'll play with this. So let me just show you what happens. OK? It was, it's breaking off now. It's hard because it's frozen. This is really cold stuff. But we know how to deal with it. Now, why does it run around on the table? How many people have made pancakes? OK. So if you, if you know your pan is hot enough when you throw a piece of water on it, and it runs around on the surface. And it lasts a long time. Why? Because the drop of water feels this hot, hot, hot surface. It's room temperature. Uh, but I mean, the surface of the pan is hot, and the water is room temperature. And it goes, oh, it's so hot, it makes a little layer of vapor. It boils off on the bottom, and it runs around on the surface. That's exactly what happens here. This stuff is so cold that it runs around. And that's why I can touch it like this, because it runs around in my hand. And it's making little, it's not burning me with the cold. It's not freezing me because it's making a little layer of vapor. And you could even do little stupid things like, things like that, but it's not working. <laughs> just, <laughs> just, just don't get it on your uh, fillings. OK, so, <laughs> so this is cold stuff. And so what do we have going on here is that what happened was, I'm going to give you a history. I showed you already that a superconductor is defined as zero electrical resistance. And this is a snapshot of history here. And I'm going to go into some of the history in some detail. In 1911, Kamerlik Onis in Leiden was trying to make things cold. And out of complete serendipity, he cooled down mercury. And I'm going to go into that history in a second, and found that it was a superconductor. <coughs> Through the years, and again, I'm going to give you snapshots as we go along here, more and more superconductors were discovered. And this is the high temperature superconducting revolution. And then in 2008, another class of superconductors, high temperature superconductors, were discovered. And I call this the beginning of all the rest of the exciting superconductors. These are called the heavy Fermion superconductors. Don't worry about the details. But this red line here is the only correlated electron problem that's solved in physics. It's the only one. On that, there's a whole bunch of families of superconductors that are not even plotted on here. And we don't know why they superconduct. I consider this the most unsolved problem in physics today. And when I give talks to high energy physics conferences, which I do occasionally, and I, when I finish the discussion, I say, 
Solving this correlated electron problem made looking for the Higgs look like a walk in the park. And it was, right? They knew the direction. They knew how to find it, and they found it. We're a little bit lost here. So I'm going to just discuss what we can do with these things. Now, a superconductor, as I mentioned, has all these correlated electrons in here. And this is true for all superconductors. They are not perfect conductors. What's the difference? If we take a piece of metal, OK, this is a superconductor, and this is a perfect conductor. And this is a type 1 superconductor. And I'll show you what a type 2 is in the next view graph. So this is above TC. TC is the superconducting transition temperature. It's C for critical. Above its critical temperature, a superconductor is just a hunk of metal. If you run magnetic field through it, the magnetic field runs through the metal. And that's true of a perfect conductor. What happens in a perfect conductor, if you've ever taken physics or if you know what happens in a perfect conductor, if you if it becomes a perfect conductor, the magnetic field lines get pinned in there. Okay? And so what happens is you lower the temperature, the magnetic field lines stay there. If you take the field off, the final state of the, of the conductor looks like a little magnet, because the magnetic field lines are stuck. A superconductor is, con is something completely different. And this was the surprising thing. This was actually discovered in the 1920s by Meissner and Oschenfeld. We call it the Meissner effect because Oschenfeld was a graduate student. So those of you that are graduate students, get your degree and get out. Um, <laughs> so it actually gets expelled. It pushes out the magnetic field, which is unlike anything we understood before. That was an indication that was some kind of long-range quantum mechanical order happening there. So then if you take the field off at low temperature, the final state of a superconductor is different than that of a perfect conductor. So that was a hint that there's something funny going on there. Now, I want to tell you what a type 2 superconductor is, because this is what we need for applications. In a type 2 superconductor, and all useful superconductors are type 2 superconductors, what happens is when you start putting field on it, you actually get some flux penetration into the superconductor. So what we have is little magnetic field lines that are going through the type 2 superconductor. And in, what happens is the field goes to the superconductor, and then it creates its own little supercurrents around there. They're called vortices. And they, they expel the rest of the magnetic field. But what's important for this is that the inside of these vortices, where the magnetic field is penetrating, the material isn't superconducting. So if those vortices can move, you're going to move some normal metal material, normal electrons, and you'll dissipate energy. So a good superconductor is one in which the vortices are pinned. That's very important. And so we spend a lot of time understanding how to make those vortices stick in there, little nails. How do we make this stick in there? And so what happens is that you have a Meissner phase, but above a certain critical field, you have a bunch of vortices that are stuck in there. And so one of the applications, which I'll show you, I think I won't try to, may not work out really well here, but I do have a demonstration. But uh, what you can do with a superconductor, and what we have here is, this is the superconductor that's cooled, and above it is a magnet. And because of this expelling the magnetic field, it actually, it literally, super electrons, which are the Cooper pairs, start running around on the surface to expel it. They make a little field. They run around on the surface, and they make a field to be an anti-magnet. So it doesn't matter which direction you are, it always floats. And those vortex lines are pinned into that material. So some of the applications, like a superconducting levitated train, are really great applications. If you try to make a levitated train with just magnets, there's a lot more engineering involved. They exist. I've ridden the one in Shanghai. It's really cool. Um, but, uh, but there's a lot of engineering because magnets are not stable. It's called Harshaw's theorem. You, can't, you cannot support a magnet over another magnet and have it be stable. You have to have some other forces in there. But because of the pinning of the vortices in a superconductor, this is stable. Now, this is a prototype they're building in Japan. They had a, a, a prototype superconducting levitated train made out of conventional superconductors in the 1960s. I've seen it, and I have pictures of it. And it only went about a kilometer, but my Japanese colleagues were very adamant in telling me this went just long enough to take their funding agents for a ride. <laughs> so now that you learned that, you're going to understand the next Colbert thing.
physics department at Ithaca College, Dr. Matthew C. Sullivan, and the quantum levitator. I know this guy, he's really cool. <laughs> this is this is a quantum levitation trap, correct? It is indeed. All right. Well, thank you so much for coming on to help me crush Jimmy with quantum levitation. Nation, as I'm sure you know, quantum levitation refers to the phenomenon whereby the magnetic flux lines flowing through a type 2 superconductor are pinned in place despite the electromagnetic forces acting upon them. I learned that from the inside of a Snapple cap. <laughs> Dr. Sullivan, Dr. Sullivan, can you confirm that if my ice cream quantum levitates, it is undeniably the ice cream of the future? Absolutely. That's just science. <laughs> okay, excellent. All right, here we have some of my American dream. It's available in mini cups, which Jimmy's is not. Okay, and I will confirm, mmm, mmm, but it is delicious. I'm now, are you ready to send my ice cream into the future? Sir, sure. right? Okay. Ice cream of the future, engage. Eat the future. We'll be right back. Hit it. <laughs> okay, so I gave you enough background to understand Colbert. So <laughs> So why do we need better superconductors, new and better superconductors? Well, one thing is that I've been in this field forever. They are a playground for really odd, strange physics. And one of the things that I study a lot is broken symmetries, and there's all kinds of symmetries they break. We like to look, physicists like to look at symmetries, and the exciting stuff happens is when the symmetry is broken. That's a whole other talk. But there's all kinds of properties these materials have that we can use, but we don't really understand why they're doing what they're doing. And we want to be able to design new materials. So just for the fundamental aspects of understanding these correlated electron systems, I'm hooked. The second thing are the applications. If you have ever been inside of an MRI, and probably most of us have here, okay, you don't get that without a type 2 superconductor. You have to go inside a superconducting magnet. How cool is that? I mean, it's great. Okay. Um, if you want to do high frequency detection, you need to use a superconductor because another property of a superconductor is that it's a voltage frequency mixer. Um, so it's used for, oh, here's an example of, of fusion research. So there's this famous uh, ITER project, which is in France, trying to make energy out of fusion, and they're using superconducting magnets. The LHC uses, can use superconducting magnets. But, uh, and what I'm going to mention here is the applications for the grid, turbines, and the superconducting magnetic energy storage devices. So these are real applications. We know how to do this now, but better superconductors would be transformative. And here's a picture I like here. This is something that my boss at Bell Labs did, and a professor here, Bill McMillan, and this graph here showed, proved the BCS theory of superconductivity. This is what we call the order parameter. So we're not going to go into this detail, but it's just, I like that font, so I like to show it. Okay. So the 20th century power grid is considered the biggest advancement uh, by the National Academy of Engineering, but in fact, it uses 19th century engineering. So this isn't really the power grid. This is the Eisenhower freeway system, but it pretty much maps the power grid. And you can see that where the energy is being used, where the bright lights are. So this does map out the power grid in a way. Now, if we're going to start using renewables, this is where we're going to mine solar power, where there's a lot of sun, sunfall, and where we're going to get wind power. There's places where we will get geothermal, etc. But then we have to take it to the population centers. And how do we get it out there? The best way to do it is with the power grid. That's a way to transport energy in a clean and efficient manner. Uh, so we want to use superconductors as an energy carrier. 
Um, I don't think I'll go into this, but if anyone's interested, this is something that we've done at the Department of Energy. I've been working on these for years, which is that there's, we've done, since 2002, reports were given to the government on how we can sustain a clean and affordable energy future. So these are called basic research needs in blank for a, uh, a sustainable energy future. And so there was a hydrogen economy, solar energy. In 2006, we wrote one on superconductivity. And we defined some interesting things. And these are supposed to go to the government and help us fund these things. But as you may know, funding goes up and down. And we've had some problems. But what we did manage to do was write this one here, which was New Science for Secure and Sustainable Energy Future, which basically took all these books and condensed them into a pamphlet. And we think that's what funded the Energy Frontier Research Centers. So you just got to stay with it and keep pushing. But in the meantime, write your Congress people and say, we want sustained funding. Um, in any case, this is what happened in our, in our report in 2006. And I just want to show you a really great plot here, which we all worked on, which is this plot here. This is what we call a phase diagram. And this phase diagram has temperature on this axis. And this is pressure, or it could be something we call doping, which is adding other materials, other atoms into the system. On this plot, which I've shown you before, I mentioned that these are the, these are the conventional superconductors. These are solved. These are the BCS electron phonon superconductors. Nothing else on that plot is, and I've left off 50 families of superconductors that we don't understand. One thing that we do know about these superconductors is they all show a similar phase diagram. And what is this phase diagram telling us? As we put pressure on this, here's like a parent compound, as we put pressure on this, we find over a certain doping or a certain pressure level, it's a superconductor. And because, of, because they're all Cooper paired, we can describe those properties, and we pretty much understand it. We may not know why they're superconducting, but we can tell you what its properties are. And over on the right side here is what we call a Fermi liquid. Fermi did everything. It's nothing left for us to do. Okay, Enrico Fermi. So because it's a Fermi liquid, it's a simple metal, and we can describe those properties. These are solved problems. Up here with all these funny letters and everything, these are what we call electron matter. And the electrons do things that just blow you away. Like there's something called electronic nematicity, which means they form, for some reason at high temperature, they group together in little sausages. Or they stripe up. Or they do funny things in energy. We don't have any equations to describe these things. And we don't know why they're happening. We also know, as, as we look over here, that as these funny electron phases, electron matter show up, the superconducting transition temperature is pushed down. These correlated electron phases are bad for superconductivity. There's no superconductivity where they get more and more correlated. But all of the superconductors show this phase diagram. All of the unconventional superconductors show this phase diagram. So although these correlated phases are bad for superconductivity, you don't get superconductivity without them. So there's some detailed balance, and that is what my research is, is trying to understand what those correlations are and why they give us superconductivity. Now, I want to tell you also that 40% of, our, of um, our energy is devoted to electrically, electrical energy production. So this has really changed a lot. So if you buy your little Energy Star refrigerator, you're not really saving that much. We're using a huge amount of electrical energy. And what does that come down to in money? As we, as we, the 21st century has new challenges. Not only do we have to worry about the capacity on the grid, and that's going to be challenged more and more as we accommodate more and more renewables. The U.S. government wants to have, by 2020, 17% of our energy production from renewables, like solar and wind energy. That's going to stress the grid even more, and we're already stressed. As a matter of fact, I love this number here. We lose $79 billion a year due to electrical energy loss. In, and that's not just the grid, that's everything. Some of it is, is unavoidable loss. But if we can add some superconductors in there, and I'll show you one application that would be fantastic, we would really save a lot. No one is saying get rid of the grid and put in superconductors. What we're saying is there are key places in the grid where you can put superconductors in and really save a lot of energy, and it's also good for national security. So now I'm going to go into the history, because this is fun. Now, every low temperature physicist is required to show this picture here. <laughs> this is what Camerlick Onis discovered. It was the race for the cold. 
he and other scientists in the world were trying to see if they could liquefy helium. Remember, this stuff is incredibly cold. It's incredibly cold if we start playing with it. And that's just liquid nitrogen. This is 77 degrees. If we, another hot gas container. So what Camel Gonus was only trying to do was, can he actually make liquid helium? And what he managed to do was using the same technique that you have in your refrigerators at home. And the way your refrigerator works at home is there's compression, et cetera, et cetera, and you can cool down with some volatile fluid, make things cold. He managed to do it with high pressure helium, and he was able to liquefy helium. And this is only liquid air, but look how cold this is. It's shrinking down this balloon. And out of, oh, sorry. So out of, <laughs> I don't like to see myself on the camera. So um, out of curiosity, he and his technician, Giles Holst, and someone says maybe Giles was dissed. I don't think so. He then went on to run Phillips Labs, so he did OK. Um, OK, so there were some predictions. What was going to happen to this clean, to, if you cool down a metal? They just thought, let's cool down a metal. And they used mercury. Why do they use mercury? Because mercury is a liquid at room temperature, and you can make it cleaner. You can boil it, and you can make it really clean. So they thought, let's cool down mercury. So they made little wires of mercury, and they cooled it down. So Lord Kelvin thought that would freeze out the carriers, and it would start being an insulator at low temperature. Dewar thought you'd go to zero, and Matheson thought it would do this. Nobody came up with this explanation. Went down in temperature, and the resistance abruptly fell to zero. Kamalik Onus went on to define not only that critical temperature, which is 4.2 degrees Kelvin, really cold, right? The background radiation is 3 degrees Kelvin. This is really cold. He managed to make this really cold, the coldest stuff you can ever imagine. And he showed that it actually became a superconductor. He also, they also did a lot more experiments. And they showed that if you put too much current in it, it stopped superconducting. Because just like temperature can break away these Cooper pairs, you put in too much energy, too much current can break the Cooper pairs. And then he started to make magnets out of it, because this stuff carried more current than anything else. But if you, so this is going to make a really big magnet. So he made really big magnets, and then he discovered critical fields. That if you put too much magnetic field on a superconductor, you also broke the pairs. Magnetic energy, current energy, thermal energy. These are things that break Cooper pairs. So if you want to make an application, you want to make sure that you can run this below a critical temperature, below a critical field, and below a critical current. Now, with this whole magnet thing, you could imagine if you make a magnet out of this stuff, you can hold the current for a long time. And that was the origin of SNES, <coughs> superconducting magnetic energy storage. Because you can hold a lot of current in one of these superconducting magnets. And there's a Chicago Trib news release that Kamerlich Onis came to Chicago and announced that superconductors hold a key to solving the global energy crisis in 1913. Smart guy. OK, so moving right along. The next history, and since I work on superconducting materials discovery, I have to mention this guy, Bert Matthias, who created, invented most of the superconductors. And he did it by serendipity. He just mixed elements. And one of the first weird, so first you go through the elements. You find that niobium superconducts, lead superconducts, as we showed you earlier, mercury superconducts. Then he just started to mix things. And he found all these things, he had no reason why. And one of the first ones was called cobalt silicide. Cobalt, as many of you might or might not know, is a magnet. It's a magnetic material. Silicon is a semiconductor. He found if he mixed cobalt and silicon and made an alloy, it was a superconductor. We don't get it, OK? There were no theories there. And he slowly went along and created more and more superconductors. And he had these rules. Transition metals are better than simple metals, like cobalt. This is something you're not going to understand, but there's certain properties of these metals that made better superconductors. And this is something that we understood. These two rules still hold for high temperature superconductors. The next two do not. They're in the wrong direction. High symmetry is good, cubic is, is best. In fact, all the high temperature superconductors are layered, almost to two dimensional. The crystal structure is very, very anisotropic, and the electronic structure is very anis anisotropic. 
stay away from oxygen, while the highest superconducting materials are, are cuprates, CuO2 planes. They have oxygen, so we don't want to stay away from oxygen. They're all, and I'll show you then, they all have magnetism involved. They all have insulating phases, and now we need theorists to help us out. So when he said stay away from oxygen, magnetism, insulating, and theorists, that wasn't necessarily true. And I didn't know Bert Matthias, but I know a lot of people that did. And he used to give talks at conferences and have a telephone on the table. And he would have his technician, who was often George Hull or someone like that, making materials. And he would say, this is being made. Who can predict if this will be a superconductor and what the TC will be? And he would ask the theorist, and then the guy would phone in, and they would be wrong. So in, in any case, <laughs> there's some good history here. Um, this is another fun. Uh, article, which is, this is also a non-technical uh, article, but if the first superconductor discovered was one of these unconventional or high temperature superconductors, how history would be changed. So if you're interested in the history, these are really good articles. So what happened then is, so the, te the critical temperature slowly raised with these kind of mixing and measuring, et cetera, et cetera, but nobody knew those, those rules that Bert Matthias had told us how to classify the superconductors, but not how to make better ones. And at the same time, we wanted applications. And so George Hume, who worked at Westinghouse, worked with his graduate student, George Hardy, and they invented the first what we call an A15 superconductor. This was the first time we understood how important the structure of the material was to being a superconductor. So this is not a random alloy. This is a compound. It has a certain crystal structure. We call it A3B, with one of the materials being a transition metal. Don't worry about it. But it has a set crystal structure. And if it's a good crystal structure, it's a good superconductor. If it's highly damaged, it's not a good superconductor. So that was really interesting to learn for that. And these were called the A15 compounds. That's what we call them. And the TC went up as high as 23 degrees. Why were these important? These were the first superconductors that can be used in a magnetic field. You can't make an MRI without a material like this. So these were really great. They had a lot of applications, but they were hard to use because they were, had this crystal structure and they were brittle. So what makes a good superconductor? George Hume went along then and then discovered practical wires. There's a random alloy called niobium titanium. You just smish it together. It's easy to make. It's malleable. And its TC is not as high. It doesn't take as much magnetic field as the A15s, but it's reliable. This is the workhorse for the field. If you want to buy a magnet, if you want to take an MRI, if you want to use something in the LHC or any of these other things, this is the material of choice because it's useful. And so you have to keep in mind, a better superconductor doesn't necessarily mean higher TC. So this is, uh, oh, by the way, when my boss retired from Bell Labs, his boss, the one who did that Macmillan Rowell figure that I showed you before, said, high TC gets Nobel Prizes which you may know that there were several Nobel Prizes given in superconductivity. But high JC, because of something like this, saves lives. And my boss, Jack Wernick, actually invented several of the um, A15 superconductors. I just thought that was sweet. Anyhow, moving right along. This, I think, was significant. And I'd just like to bring this up, because this gets overlooked. This guy, Frank Steglisch, discovered something called a heavy Fermion superconductor. These are really weird materials. These are, again, uh, correlated electrons go back to the 50s. In the 70s, he discovers these materials that if you measure the electronic mass thermodynamically, and you can, you can do things called specific heat, and you can measure what the electronic mass is. The electronic mass is like 500, 1,000 times higher than the free electron mass. There's no way to explain that simply. We don't really understand this. But he also discovered that these strange high electron mass materials, heavy fermions, can superconduct. And this figure came out of Gil Landris's group a couple years later. And what this is is using one of these heavy fermion materials. And they all have, they all have these heavy, heavy elements in there. They're called 5D or 4D elements at the bottom of the periodic table. And um, they, uh, they all have the phase diagram that I showed you before. There's a superconducting dome. And there's some antiferromagnetism here. They all have antiferromagnetism all, all ferromagnetism. They all do. <coughs> And over here is the Fermi liquid. And there's some weird, weird stuff. This is where they're heavy, up here on this phase diagram. So this is the first time that we realized what's going on here. Magnetism seems to be good for superconductivity. And there's some weird stuff going on we don't understand. 
So this is when we started to realize that the old electron phonon interaction of the BCS theory was starting to break down. Now we know it does break down. And then just to do some history, I like to bring this up because there were predictions that worked out. Some people say, I discovered, I predictively designed these superconductors. Marvin Cohn's PhD thesis in the 60s was that this insulator, strontium titanate, should superconduct, and it does. You can dope it, you can take the oxygen out, you can put it under pressure and it superconducts. Um, and Mathis and Hammond predicted this superconductor, the electronic structure calculation, and in fact, it is a superconductor. Bednorst and Mueller discovered the high temperature superconductors in 1986. Chu and Wu discovered the super high TC superconductors in also in the, in, the, in the 80s. And I just want to say these were transformative. They're amazing. They led way to discover whole new families of superconductors. But I want to point something out. They say they predictively designed a superconductor. These are like the smartest people I've ever met. They're scary smart. And they work like dogs. I mean, Chu is like in the lab 24-7, okay, like all the time. They really work on this stuff, and they each have had one hit. Okay, so did they predictively design these superconductors? I want to see a second hit, a second family. Then we'll know they've done it. So that's why I can say we don't know how to do this. What happened was the cooperates were discovered in the 80s, and then it was 20 years that no new high temperature superconductors were found. Hideo Hasono, a chemist at University of Tokyo, was looking for transparent conductors. This is what's used in your iPad. Okay, we've got one of the world's experts over there. He's, hi, John. So, <laughs> so um, he, was, he was studying new transparent conductors, and what he happened to find was this material we call the 1111. Lanthanum, iron, arsenic, oxygen, doped with fluorine, was a superconductor. He wasn't looking for that. He found it. But then what happened, it really sparked an interest. A whole new class of high-temperature superconductors were found. Uh, Zhang then just, they just filled, cleaned up the field in a few months. And they, this TC went up to, I think it's about 59 degrees now for the high-temperature superconductor in degrees Kelvin. Um, one of the things I like to point out for funding is that the, when after Hasano discovered this superconductor serendipitously, the Japanese government put $25 million in a few months into this field. It did not go to Hasano, but a lot of it did, and there were a lot of great discoveries that happened there. Hasano then later discovered another new transparent conductor that's used in the latest iPad. So maybe they got some returns back from funding that science. Just, sorry, politics, moving right along. Um, so uh, I've already gone over this, so I'm just going to remind you again. This is TC versus time, and these are the conventional superconductors, and all the ones out here are unconventional, uh, the, and many aren't plotted. I believe they started here with the discovery of heavy fermions, and all the superconductors out here are things we don't understand. They're all useful, and they're all practical. And they all show the same phase diagram. I could show you hundreds of phase diagrams. I'm just going to show you a few. Here's the one we saw the first time with the dome. These are organic superconductors. Here's a superconducting dome. These are the cuprates, Fermi liquid superconducting dome. I've spent a huge amount of time looking at the iron-based superconductors that Hasano st studied. We've got a superconducting dome, funny phases up here. The funny phases are funny, and they're not all the same funny phase, and that's what we study. Um, and so I wrote this article, which is, and it's actually pretty neat. Um, Discovering a new superconductor, and I'll show you some of the applications, can have such great ramifications that we all want to do this. And when in the, in the 2000s, when uh, the iron-based superconductors were discovered, it gave us a new shot in the arm, like, wow, if there's a second class of superconductors, there must be a third. Let's go find it. And so what I started to do is have working groups and all these different superconductivity meetings. Let's put our heads together and compare notes how can we design a superconductor? And it actually was pretty, sort of like my world peace call, like let's all work together. And you know, people are sharing ideas, uh, but we still haven't figured it out. So we're still working on it, so it's a hard problem. Now I want to tell you now, go into a little bit of the applications. Um, there are several different kinds of superconducting wires. The first superconducting wire, which we call the first generation wires, were basically taking, um, I should tell you, these high temperature superconductors are even more difficult to work with 
and more brittle, and the crystal structure is even more important than the A15s. And I have some up here that we can play with. I don't know if we can, can I make these float? I don't know. But I have some up here, so it's probably not worth trying to do here because it'll take time and it's hard to see. So this is this liquid nitrogen, which is really cold. And I can take a piece, this is a high temperature superconductor that we made in the lab, and I'm gonna cool it down here. And if you come up and look at this stuff, this high temperature superconductor looks like a black flower pot. Okay, it's, it's, let me move this float. Ah, didn't float, okay. Well, it takes a second to make this work, so it's not me. Really, you can just sit here and watch me fail. It's always fun. But we'll play with this later. There. That one's floating. I don't know if you can see. If you can't, that's okay. We'll come up later. But they're hard, and they're brittle, and they're hard to work with. So the first superconducting wires were really lousy. They were silver tubes that you packed full of one of the high temperature superconductors, the one we call BISCO. And then you extruded, et cetera, et cetera, and you had multi-filament wires. And this is what the cross section looked like. And how malleable were they? How bendable were they? If you take a wire like this and you went like this, you were okay, but if you went like this, they weren't superconducting anymore. So they were difficult. But the in-ground applications that I will show you were mostly made these, were made out of this first, first generation wire. So in 1986 was the discovery of high temperature superconductivity. By 1989, they were already making these wires. And by 2001, there were in-ground demos. Then there were a couple of discoveries of how to make better wires. They were called the IBAD or the RABID process. And the leaders in the world in producing these things are actually from the United States, American Superconductor and, uh, and uh, Superpower. And they have pretty much the same design. And what they have is a complicated multi-layer technology where 2% of the cross-section is superconducting. But there, I'll show you a manufacturing process in a later slide. You can now make these reel-to-reel. -reel. You can bend these, and they're reliable. But there's some real drawbacks to these things. Uh, one of them is that since you have to make them in two-dimensional tapes, the direct, they're hard to make into useful wires. And if you want to make a great magnet out of these, you can't. What, I'm gonna, what I just learned recently is that there's a group in China that learned how to make round cables of the superconductor. This is really new. And so the National High Field Magnet Laboratory is now making, designing and building a new high field magnet that should go to 65 Tesla because they're making it with these round wires. If you want to make a very, very large magnetic field, you have to use a superconductor. And if you want it really big, it turns out the high temperature superconductors can carry more current at a higher field than anything else. So if you want to make a 65 Tesla magnet, you have to use a high temperature superconductor. So there's, there's applications that are beyond just the conductivity part. In any case, I want to also stress that these are really great, that even though 2% of the cross section is superconducting, they carry five times the power than copper at the same cross-sectional area. So there's problems with them, but they're really amazing wires, and there's been a lot of R&D that went into these through the years. So this is an example at, uh, I believe this is American Superconductor. They could make these reel-to-reel. -reel. In the old days when they were making cables, they had to use these big warehouses because they had a, you couldn't bend the wires, you know. And so now they can make them reel-to-reel. -reel. And so here's an example under William Street in New York City that you really have a capacity problem. And if you can carry five times the power at the cross-sectional area, you're going to help some of this r underground rat's nest. So th that's some of the applications we have here. Um, so I mentioned all this stuff already, but there's there, some of the barriers to grid penetration is it's still really expensive. But as I, I want to also point out that as we are stressing, stressing our global energy problems, as we need to use we have to put more energy into our grid, that the price is getting less and less of a problem. So we do need to reduce the price of these, and the problem is that it's multi-layer and they're slow to make. That's the main barrier for the price. Multi-layer technology, they're very slow to make. But it's getting to the point now, at least in short distances, they're practical and useful. Um, uh, so we just need to test them out more. 
And so here are some places they are being tested. Um, I think this one in Columbus, Ohio is no longer in operation. Why? So these two are, this is the, the Long Island, New York cable. So they have in-ground cables and they have transformer stations that are made out of high temperature superconductors, mostly generation one, but there are some generation two in ground. The problem with this right now is the funding. So a very short number of years ago, the US government, Department of Energy, has its Office of Electricity, and for some reason, they zeroed out the superconductivity research. So that's what funded this, and now it's no longer there. Write your Congress people. So moving right along, the idea is to have parallel to the existing grid. Or, so this is like if we would have like little spots where we'd have superconductors in there. Or, this is the one that breaks my heart. We have to do this. This is called the Three Amigas Project. It turns out that the United States has three separate grids. And the grids are AC power because Mr. Tesla beat out Mr. Edison. Tesla wanted AC. Why? Because AC, you can transform up and down with transformers. So if you go out in the long lines, you have 700 kilovolts carrying energy across you know, the Great Plains. And then you can transform down to lower and lower voltage to 110 volts in our, in our houses. And so that's one of the reasons. And at very, very high voltage, you can have very little current and you have less resistive losses. So that's, anyhow, that's a little too much information, but that's one of the reasons we went that way. In any case, we have three separate grids. And there's another physics rule, which is if you have AC circuits, if you just connect them, because AC is alternating current and there's a phase associated with that, if you just connect them, you can lose a huge amount of power. So since we have three grids and they're not connected, you can't just connect them. And the three grids are the Western Interconnect, the Eastern Interconnect, and the Texas Interconnect. I don't know the history. I have gotta find this out. But they're separated. And the Three Amigas project was a way to connect these. And I wanna bring this up now because something that maybe someone here can tell me, because I don't know. I was at an academy meeting a few weeks ago and this was brought up again. And they said that having these three grids separate that you don't have a continuous flow of electricity across the United States was a problem for national security. I don't know why, but if anyone can explain that to me, that was in the talk. In any case, the whole idea is that you can use superconductors to connect them. Just this small area in New Mexico, you would then convert down to DC, have a superconducting table connect, and invert back up to AC. I may have invert and convert backwards, I'm not sure. But you would connect these through DC superconductivity, it's localized, easy to cool, and connect these grids. So that's something that was going to be funded, started in motion, and then it was zeroed out, so that's too bad. Anyhow, it would be great. Now the turbines, there's a lot of research being done on this. It turns out that a superconducting transformer is just lighter, and it's easier to make, and you can make them direct drive. Right now, as we look around, the turbines are getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Some of them are the size of 737s. So if you can dramatically reduce the weight of the transformer in the or the, the, the anti-motor in the middle, you're gonna have, it's gonna have a big impact. And so there's a lot of work being done on these. And it's localized, it's easy to cool this motor. Another thing, and oh, I just throw this in here. That's bad, that's good, okay. Um, so, <laughs> So an idea, that, and this is a pipe dream, is that maybe you could put the turbines offshore. This doesn't exist, this is a cartoon. You can put the turbines offshore near the population centers, collect the energy, drive them into the SMEZ, and carry the SMEZ to New York. Okay, that's one of these pipe dreams that we think about with man and So let me tell you a little bit more about a SMEZ. A SMEZ is the superconducting magnetic energy so storage. This is what Kamerlich Onis did in 1911 and 12 and 13. It's just a way of collecting energy in a wire. It turns out that they're actually pretty fast. They're not nanosecond fast, but they're seconds fast. They can collect and disperse energy pretty quickly. Photovoltaics, which a lot of people here work on, are actually have a lot of variability in them. Not only do they collect are they useful in the daytime and they're not at nighttime, they also tend to be fairly noisy. So the idea is, and there's some in ground in Wisconsin in the grid and they're being tested today, is to collect the day and nighttime changes and the little bit of spikiness that happens in there in these SMEs. And then at a time that you choose to bleed it out into the grid in a continuous 
you know, easy way, and so you can, you, you don't have to worry about these variations. So that's a real application, and so part of, some of the people in our Energy Frontier Research Center is working on this. This is Brookhaven working with uh, American super, no, Superpower trying to make these SMES devices. I will tell you that if anybody that knows anything about this, this is a pitifully low number, and there's a long way to go, but at least they're doing the research on them. Um, I will spend another 30 seconds telling you about my research, because I don't think anybody here cares, but we do something called point contact spectroscopy. It's an old technique that we found out is, and we just, we published the theory in January, we just found out is specifically sensitive to these electron correlations. So you just take a little tiny skinny tip, Omar's doing some of this here, and you touch it to the surface, and it gives you information about the electronic properties of a material, spectroscopic information. And one of the things we looked at are these pneumatic phases. This is a picture of a pneumatic liquid crystal, and at high temperature, the electrons in some of these iron-based superconductors look like that. They form these little balloony phases at very high temperature, and it turns out we're sensitive to that. And we have a little model as to why they're happening. Here are some data. This excess conductance that we see here is that nematicity. Um, we can map out areas in the phase diagram where this nematicity exists. And I would love to spend a lot of time on this, on this picture, but I'm not going to bore you. If you're interested, look me up, because I do want to talk about it, but not in this form. Um, and this guy here, Wei Ching Li, who's now a professor at Binghamton, was the postdoc that figured out why, in fact, we can do this, why we do see what we see, and why it is specifically a filter that we can pick up correlated phases. And when phase transitions happen from simple things, like antiferromagnetism, but it's not due to electron correlations, we don't see it. So why this point contact specifically sniffs out correlated phases, we finally understand. And it's really kind of complicated, but I, I think I can get through it. So let me, oh, uh, then finally, I just have to throw, this is our materials design flowchart. So we're, we, we pick out, this is what we don't know how to do, if anybody has ideas. What we'd like to do is the reverse source problem. Have a theorist tell us what materials will be correlated. They can't do that. So what we're doing is, is looking, we're getting together all the time, and we look at phase diagrams. In other words, you know, ruthenium, oxygen, calcium, which happens to be ruthenium, sulfur, calcium. There's no phases that exist there. We're studying them. We're doing computation to see if the materials will form. Uh, we're trying to make them. We're trying to measure them to see if they are making superconductors. We've been doing this a few months to make this kind of flowchart type loop. Um, <clears throat> we're writing papers to saying which ones have failed, and that's all we have right now. So moving right along, and I'll finish up now because it's been going long enough. Uh, oh, except I have to tell you that how cold this stuff is, and that I wanted to show. How many balloons did I blow up? What color? They were blue and yellow. So it turns out that we have a lot more balloons here. This stuff is so cold that you can just these little pancakes. Ah. <laughs> So if we could design, <laughs> so you guys can come up and play with these if you want. And if anybody has an idea as how we can design new superconductors, let me know because we're stuck. Thank you very much. Does anybody have any questions? Thank you, Laura, so much. Uh, and we'll, we'll have time for a few questions right here first. Uh, I have a few questions. One is, uh, do the materials that you need for the superconductor, do they already come in rarity or location or how do you get them? Great question. <laughs> Okay, so the first question is, are these critical materials? The answer is yes. So all, all of these materials, we've mentioned transition metals, but most of them also use rare earths. 
So if you want to make really great magnets, this magnet here has rare earth materials in it, and those are mined in China, and there's a big worry that, in fact, we're not going to be able to get these at will, like we can now. And so the government has put a lot of money into trying to create better magnets without using critical materials. In fact, there's an energy hub in Ames, Iowa that does this. So <laughs> um, uh, the next one is, uh, what about instead of using the grid, having local energy sources? The, the truth is, we have to go after all these things. We're in trouble. So having these, these little energy sources, our own solar energy, for our own houses and making our own energy, and whatever you can do, people talk about these little nuclear things that you can put in your backyard. I think we have to go at every single one of these. We have to do this and that. And so, yeah, we need all that stuff. We're in trouble. We're badly polluting our atmosphere. Global climate change is a problem, and uh, we need to find a better way to do this. So. Good questions. Yes. Could, could we go to the gentleman standing at the mic? Hi, gentleman yeah. standing up at the mic. Curious about um, what makes the ice cream float. Is that the standard demo, or was that just a little different? No, that's the standard demo. In fact, there's a switch. So, um, ma <laughs> that's the fun part. <laughs> I can't make it. There we go. Um, so, uh, the Matthew was. Uh, he actually had a YouTube on this. And he and his students made this track, and they made a YouTube. And then they invited him to go to New York and work with Colbert. And so there's the bot this, this ice cream container has liquid nitrogen in it with, with, the, um, with the superconductor on the bottom. And he does do a switch. And so it is the standard demo. Question right here. The young lady right here in the pink. Sure, another good question. So I, I'm, repeat it, the question was, can wind turbines be dangerous for marine life if you're using them in the ocean? One of the problems that they found here, and I'm not an expert on this, is that the turbines, if they run at their maximum speed, or you know, velocity, whatever you call it, um, can, the, the certain kind of vibrations can be very damaging to, co to crop growth. So these are things that have to be studied. So there are probably certain frequencies that will be damaging to marine life, and all that stuff has to be studied, which is why I'm always fond of saying, it was here at the University of Illinois, we have our Center for Advanced Study, and I just had to write a, a review and a strategic plan for that. And our center is incredibly broad. It doesn't just have scientists. It has you know, people in English and fine arts and agriculture. It's incredibly broad. If we're going to address these energy problems of the 21st century, we need everyone working together. We need to understand the sociological aspects, the growth aspects, the marine life aspects, et cetera. And so we don't know what the ramifications are, and those all have to be studied. Good question. Could we take this one right back here? Um, so the superconductors have to be kept at a very low temperature in order to work. And so uh, it would take energy to keep them that cool consistently. So how much of the energy that you save by having zero resistance then goes into keeping them at a temperature that they can do that? Another good question. So, so that is in the equation. And it turns out for the, for the near short, short distance applications, it's a win. So the Three Amigas project is a win. And if you can just cool it with cryogens, like liquid air, it's also a win. Um, it's not hard to make liquid air. For the low temperature superconductors, the ones that I, use to, that I use in the laboratory to make high magnetic fields, it's not necessarily when they're, they're more expensive. But right now, many of these tapes to be used in the ground that are being tested now, um, it, it's possible. You, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but I know they've been calculated and I've seen talks on it. And some of my colleagues at American Superconductor have shown me the data. So the answer is, in some cases, yes. <laughs> Okay, uh, right over here. Okay, you got me all fired up. Oh, good. I don't know what to do. I put in geothermal, and that's working great. But what else can we do to save electricity? Or speed? What, are, what can we do? What? Yeah. There's other people that could probably speak on this better than I can, but I think, you know, you know just your general energy savings. If you go to, I mean, if you go to a hotel in Korea, you know, the, or, or in Europe, you, you can't leave your lights on all the time. You have to put your, your little card in the door to make sure you have energy. So we just use, we just really waste a lot of energy. 
keeping your, you know, I think it's just, I'm not an expert on this, but I think if you just pay attention to energy savings, that's going to be useful. Recycling, energy <coughs> savings, anything that will stop stressing. I, now, I've given up, completely given up buying plastic bottles, right? I go everywhere with a bottle like this because you've probably seen recently how much plastic we're putting into the ocean. So again, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a lab rat, well, not so much as I'd like to be, but um, I don't know enough about this as I should, but I think what you can get on the web and talking to other people. Uh, one of the experts is at our university named Scott Willenbrock, and there's a few other people that really know how to do this. Oh, you're an expert, okay. So can you answer the question? Okay, do you want to say anything now? Yeah. You turning lights off. Those are the keys. Okay. I got it right. Do I get a B plus? <laughs> Absolutely. A plus. So I, I, I really appreciate Laura sure. being here. Let's give her a hand again. And I, I do believe you're going to stick around a little bit. Sure. And f please come on up and, and have a look at the demos. And if there's any food left, please help yourself. And thank you all for coming out and making this a success on this weekend. Thank you very much. Illinois.